Hi there, and welcome to this next talk. In this session, we're gonna talk about practical muscle ultrasound, starting with the upper limb muscle ultrasound anatomy. There are some preparations before every measurement if you do muscle ultrasound and you want it to be reproducible. We're gonna go through them one by one when we're discussing the several muscles that are in the upper extremity. You can choose many protocols. We have data for like 30 muscles. If you know, or you want to know how to scan them, you can find them on the Dutch neuromuscular ultrasound website and they are arbitrary and yours to choose. There are some pitfalls though. Please avoid a suboptimal scan angle because if you tilt the probe, the image will go dark and that will confuse your um, assessment. Also try not to compress the muscle because the thickness will change and try not to have the patient contract. So make it so that they can be relaxed in a chair or on the examination bed. Let's start out with the deltoid. Here's the scan protocol and demo for that muscle. So first, when you prepare the measurements, choose the appropriate preset. And we re really recommend you to save the settings in such a preset and set the appropriate depth. For the deltoid, this would be four centimeters, but it depends on the muscle and the patient size. Here's the anatomical pictures for the deltoid. It has three heads, the anterior, medial, and posterior part. Usually we scan the middle part, as you see here. So this is an image of the scan position and the corresponding muscle ultrasound. And there's a standardized size at one fourth from the acromion to the elbow crease. Here's how that works in practice. We measure the patient from the acromion to the elbow crease, and then mark the correct measurement area on the skin. The area always corresponds to the area of the maximum muscle bulk. Next, the probe is put on the skin and you can see the deltoid coming in view. Now we try to outline it so that the humerus is mostly centered, but at least you should capture a big chunk of that middle deltoid muscle. We annotate the image and then we take the probe off and put it back on three times and capture three images to average the echogenicity measurements later. Of course, you can always do a visual assessment as well. And we recommend doing both. Finally, we're measuring muscle diameter from the bone to the subcutaneous fascia, and we measure the subcutaneous fascia diameter. And this principle will be repeated throughout this course. Just as a case example, here's a deltoid muscle in a patient with facio-scapulohumeral dystrophy. And you can see that it's affected. It's much wider than the subcutaneous tissue that overlies it. So this would be a HACMAT grade two muscle. And we'll talk about that grading skill in a later session. Here's the scan demo for the biceps brachii. Again, here are the preparations. And we just talked about preset and depth. You should also try not to touch any gain settings or time gain controls during your measurements, as this will change the echogenicity on the screen, and that confuses your assessment. Here's the anatomical region of the biceps brachii. You can see it's a it lies on top of brachialis, so it's two muscles in that ventral forearm, uh, upper arm. Sorry. Here's the scan position showing you biceps and brachialis on the humerus. Try to get the humerus in the middle of your screen. And we measure at two thirds from the acromion to the elbow crease, corresponding again with the largest muscle diameter. So here you see the length measurement from acromion to elbow crease. And then with a quick calculation, mark the correct position on the skin. Next, the probe is put on the muscle and the humerus is put into the middle of the screen with a slight tilting to ensure maximum reflectivity or maximum brightness of your image, and especially the humeral lining. This makes sure that you have a 90 degree scan angle. The muscle is annotated and measured three times, taking the probe off and putting it back on the skin. This will avoid measurement errors by averaging your results. And after this, this three measurements, the fourth measurement is used for muscle diameter. And we measure the brachialis as well, because sometimes in pathology, you can't see the discrimination between the two muscles. So the bone is better. 
Here's a case example of dynamic muscle ultrasound showing you fasciculations, little tiny quirky jumpy movements that are unpredictable in biceps brachii. And in another case example, we're gonna show you a transverse and then longitudinal image of an affected biceps brachii in a patient with a congenital myopathy. And you can see the brightness of the muscle and also the tissue fiber direction disruption if you scan in this longitudinal direction especially around the center fascial lining there, which is quite bright. Now, in a short follow-up clip to this one, we can have the patient contract. You can see the contractures are not very strong. She's weak in this muscle, and you see tiny muscle contraction and shortening. Here's the scan demo protocol for the triceps brachii. Again, with all the preparations, we mark the skin, and we put the probe on the lateral head of the triceps, getting the humerus into view on the edge of the image to give you a good chunk of triceps in the middle of your screen. This is the indicator of the triceps there. You can also see a vessel and the radial nerve right uh, to the right and above the humerus there in the right part of the screen. And here's the triceps brachii again in a patient with congenital myopathy, showing you this slight increased brightness and changes around one of the facial edges, just like we've seen before. So the probe is put on. You can see the muscle is slightly hyperechogenic, and there's a brightness around one of the facial structures there in the top left. When we twist the probe 90 degrees, you can still, still discern the fiber direction, so it's not a completely destroyed muscle yet but there is pathology starting in that facial area. Let's go to the forearm flexor muscles and we will focus on the flexor carpi radialis. Again, here are the preparations. And we talked about the first five, but also please keep your patient in a standard position, usually supine on an examination bench, but they can also be scanned in a wheelchair as long as you keep the protocol the same. Now here's the scan position for the forearm flexors with the FCR in the middle of the screen. It's that almost heart-shaped muscle there. Here's the anatomical reference for it. FCR forms sort of a yin-yang dual with pronated teres. You will see that when you start scanning. And here's the practical scan demo. Patient is positioned supine. We measure from the elbow crease to the wrist, selecting the maximum muscle bulk at one third along that length and marking it on the skin. Next, the probe is put on, and you can see the flexor muscle region coming into view. You can also see the underlying bones, the higher one being the radius and the lower one, the ulna. The muscle is nice and oval. It's in the middle of the screen here. We annotate the image, and then put the probe on and take it off three times to capture three images for offline echo genesity analysis. Please ensure an optimal 90 degree angle by ensuring the brightest bone reflection underneath. This will give you a good reproducible image. And finally, we measure muscle, muscle diameter from the lower to the upper fascia and then the subcutaneous layer. Now you could also do other things with ultrasound, such as identify anatomical regions. For example, if you want to do needle EMG, this is the thumb flexor you see moving right here. This is the index finger, and this is the middle finger. Now the patient is trying to selectively move the ring finger, which is a little more hard, and then the little finger. It's excellent for an anatomical identification. Next up, we're gonna see a scan demo of flexor carpi ulnaris. This is a nice oval shaped muscle with a central tendon in it, right in the top middle of the screen here. And it's very useful to scan together with the deep flexors that we'll talk about later. This is the ulna, that's the FCU, and there's the ulna nerve. And between FCU and the ulna nerve are the deep flexors. And you can use them, for example, in inclusion body myositis, where the two will be differentially affected. Now the muscle is measured again, from the lower to the upper facial boundary, and we measure the subcutaneous layer. And here's an example of that muscle in a patient with the congenital myopathy. 
And you can see the muscle itself is slightly hyperechogenic, a little more bright, but the deep finger flexors are even brighter. So they are more affected and they're almost obscuring the ulna that is in the lower left corner there. So you can see the differential affection of a forearm in several muscle dystrophies. It's not always a uniform disease. Here's the corresponding protocol, but then for the deep finger flexors. Again, we talked about all these requisitions for a very reproducible measurement. Finally, you also probably need to load the patient from a work list and make a report. Don't forget to put this in the electronic health record or the patient chart. So here's the deep finger flexors. They are a large chunk um, of muscle lying beneath the ulna and the FCU. And you can see it annotated here with the deep flexors, the FCU and the and ulnar nerve underneath FCU, like a bunch of grapes hanging there. Here's the practical scan protocol. Patient is positioned supine, the arm is flexed, and we measure from the elbow, the electron to the wrist crease, selecting the appropriate measurement point where the muscle has its maximum bulk. Putting the probe on, and then getting the deep finger flexors in the middle of the view, with the FCU and the ulna, really recognizable there, and the ulna nerve. And can, you can see a vessel pulsating. We're gonna annotate the image. These are the deep flexors. And we're scanning on the right. And take the probe on and put it back, uh, take the probe off and put it back on three times to ensure reproducibility of the offline ultrasound echogenicity analysis. When we've captured the three still images for storage, we're going to measure muscle diameter all the way to the interosseous membrane in this case. So here's the first depth marker. And the second one, and then we we'll measure the subcutaneous layer. Now let's look at some other things you can do, such as guide an EMG needle to the deep finger flexor region. So here's that forearm, the deep flexors and the flexor carpi ulnaris, and the needle is in view. And this is called an in-plane technique where you get the whole needle beneath the ultrasound probe, see it until the tip. So it's very safe and you actually know exactly where that needle tip is and what you're recording. And I can highly recommend it for selective EMG studies. The patient is moving slightly, as you see. There's another case example of a patient with IBM who actually has fibrillations. And if you set a high enough frame rate, like 72 hertz in this case, you can see the tiny trembling movements. I will point them out for you. They are in this region, while the subcutaneous region is still. So that's fibrillations. <laughs> And then finally, we're gonna look at the scan demo for the first dorsal interosseous muscle in the hand. That is scanned between the thumb, uh, the base of the thumb and the index finger midway in a transverse direction. You can see the metacarpal bones with the muscle in between. Again, ensure maximum brightness and then annotate your image, take the probe off and put it back on three times to ensure reproducibility in the offline analysis. It's a nice big muscle and the adductor polyps is lying underneath it. We create the optimum image, save it, and then finally measure diameter from the lower fascial boundary to the upper fascial boundary. And then the subcutaneous layer, which is really thin in this region. Now as a final case example, here are some fasciculations, but there are a few and a pulsation artifact in the FDI. There's the pulsation artifact and the first fasic. And you can see these tiny twitching movements in this muscle. It's a small fasciculation. There's gonna be another one here, two times. And you can see that ultrasound is a nice way to scan for these. Thank you very much for watching this upper extremity anatomy. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.